Hello, uh, my name is Anne Amin. I'm a legal and governance specialist at UN Habitat at the policy legislation and governance section. I've been working with UN Habitat for over 20 years in several different roles and, uh, and more recently mainly in providing advisory services for member states in governance and legislative processes. Some of my areas of expertise include urban governance, physical planning law, climate change law, as well as human rights. Today I'll give you a brief overview of the state of urban governance in African cities with a focus on the benefits of effective governance as well as the challenges that it can address. So first, if we look at what is urban governance, the concept of governance is complex as well as controversial. Governance as a concept recognizes that power exists inside as well as outside the formal authority and institutions of government. Governance includes three main actors. The government at all levels, the private sector as well as civil society. Governance recognizes that decisions are made on based on complex relationships between all these many actors who all have very different priorities. The reconciliation of these competing priorities is at the heart of the concept of governance. Now, if we think why is urban governance important? It's not so much the governance, but the quality of the urban governance that is important. It's actually one of the most important factors for the eradication of poverty and for cities to be able to prosper. It can ensure that all urban residents can reap the benefits from urbanization. Effective governance can reduce mismanagement, ensure that the views of minorities are considered, and that the voices of the most vulnerable in society are heard in the decision-making processes. Achieving the sustainable development goals that were set in 2015 requires strong political institutions and processes. The 17 SDGs can only be achieved through effective governance frameworks at all levels, international, national and local levels. The three pillars of effective governance include effectiveness, accountability and inclusiveness. Now, if we look um, into Africa, I think it has been highlighted already in uh, Mr. Omar Silla's uh, presentation that Africa is characterized by a fast-growing population together with strong urbanization, which sets multiple challenges in terms of urban governance. Africa's rapidly urbanizing cities are confronted with a range of pressing issues, such as rising food prices, threats from climate change on infrastructure as well as housing, and of course the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on local finances. The generally weak capacity of government bodies to plan for and manage urban growth in Africa have led to the rise of inequality, increasing prevalence of informality and health risks. Now, most African cities must cope with the situation of having close to 30% of the population living on income levels that are below the poverty line, with an average of 70% of residents living in informal settlements with poor access to basic services such as water and sanitation. It's actually quite shocking to learn that only 55% of Africa's urban residents have access to basic sanitation services, while around 69 million African urban residents have no access whatsoever to safe water services. For example, in Johannesburg, 31% of households in informal settlements have access to piped water and electricity, while in the informal settlements of Nairobi, only 7% of the households do. Slums and informal settlements are largely the outcomes of lack of effective governance, as well as lack of access to urban land and housing. So, all in all, extensive governance reform is critical for effective delivery of affordable housing, social services and urban infrastructure. 
Given the diversity of the African continent, governance reforms must be context specific. There is no one size fits all solutions. The challenge of African urban sustainability calls for a focus on people-centered cities based on multi-level governance, cooperation, collective action and solidarity. Decisions regarding urban governance are made based on complex relationships between many actors. They all have different priorities and all of these should be considered when defining a new governance model for African cities. The key actors in urban governance in African cities include all levels of government, from the national to the local levels, the political parties, traditional leaders, private sector organizations, and informal business organizations, such as traders organizations, international agencies, and civil society organizations. But we should not also forget the local communities, because they have a much better understanding of the territorial needs and priorities from the places where they live. And therefore they can be giving a very fundamental contribution to the development of these areas in which they live. Now, we have uh, discussed the different actors and also how power influences governance. A common uh, problem is the unbalanced power relations that manifest in the negoci negotiations and contestations of urban spaces and they can really undermine the core functions of institutions. For example, through exclusion, where some individuals or groups are systematically sidelined from policy decisions that affect their interests. There's also capture, where influential groups can, so to say, capture uh, policies to make them serve their narrow interests to block competition, for example. And finally, we have clientelism, where benefits are exchanged in return for political support. For example, where public officials solicit votes um, in exchange for short-term benefits, maybe subsidies, transfers, something like that. And of course, there's also corruption. But to manage these issues, um, the new urban agenda proposes that first, for the optimum delivery of urban services, the national local government interface must be strong with proper inter-institutional hierarchies and coordination. This is what we call multi-level governance, which I had mentioned earlier. Secondly, the recognition that local governments are the ones who are responsible for the provision of most services requires a focus on decentralization in accordance with the principle of subsidiarity and accompanied by capacity building. Third, um, the effective urban governance needs to appreciate the role of the private sector. It can be a complementing partner of public authorities in service provision and its ability to spur economic growth and generate employment cannot be understated. Now, most African countries did not have a tradition of strong local government in the colonial or early post-independence eras. However, there's been a shift towards decentralization in Africa from the late 90s. The African Union has also placed decentralization on the agenda through the adoption of the African Charter on the values and principles on decentralization, local governance and local development in 2014. Decentralization implies the transfer of power, responsibilities, capacities and resources from national to all subnational levels of government. Some African countries have defined themselves as federations, for example, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Somalia, Comoros, while others have established the division of powers and functions among different spheres of government in their constitutions, such as South Africa or Kenya. Some of the countries that have strived to elaborate constitutional frameworks that devolve power away from the center have ended up giving significant authority to regions and not to local governments. All in all, the implementation of decentralization in Africa
has been uneven and partial, which sometimes has led to local governments that are weak, disorganized, inadequately trained and staffed and under-resourced compared to the new range of responsibilities that they are expected to take on. To provide an example, based on a recent study of UN Habitat, the level of decentralization of splan spatial planning functions between the central government and the local level is only at 53% in sub-Saharan Africa, which is relatively low if you compare it to the land-rich developed countries where all the spatial planning functions are devolved to the municipal level of government. To give a few examples, Niger State has a decentralized planning process according to the legal framework, but since local planning authorities are absent, all decisions concerning urban planning are made at the central level. In Cameroon and Uganda, urban planning is less centralized. In Cameroon, local governments can approve, validate, as well as implement the urban plans, while in Uganda, local governments formulate and implement urban plans that are then approved at the central level. So to go back to decentralization, it is a powerful tool to promote meaningful engagement of citizens in decision making, as well as holding public institutions more accountable for what they're doing. It's much easier to hold local officials accountable for their actions than it is to impose the accountability on politicians at much higher levels of government. It can provide greater protection of minority groups by guaranteeing local autonomy, especially to questions considered important to ethnic identity, which can reduce the potential of conflict within the wider national political arena. It can also enhance community trust and ownership, as local governments are geographically closer to the people they serve and have the local knowledge Autonomy allows the services to be more easily adapted to the local circumstances, priorities and needs. Now, uh, we've discussed the decentralization, but just decentralizing responsibilities without the fiscal decentralization, um, things will not work out. Without the fiscal decentralization, local governments don't have the adequate resources to effectively perform their devolved functions. Multi-level governance without fiscal decentralization results in the lack of financial resources at the local level and therefore the incapacity of cities to cover the cost needed to provide the basic urban services such as infrastructure and access to water and sanitation. The level of fiscal decentralization is still very low in many African countries, where local governments control less than 5% of the national public expenditure. Secondary cities in Africa face particularly severe challenges as they generally have much weaker urban economies than the primate cities that dominate the economic and political life of their countries. Finally, building people-centered cities requires the adoption and implementation of mechanisms to ensure citizens' participation. To conclude, um, I could say that multi-level governance can produce many positive externalities and it has positive effects also on participation and therefore on local communities. Many countries in Africa have already adopted or are adopting more decentralized models because they do enhance the development by creating closer ties between government and the people to ensure that development projects reflect the regional and local preferences and resources are spread uh, more equitably across the country. Multi-level governance and decentralization also facilitate democracy because it enables the communities to have a more direct say in matters of regional and local concern. It can curb the abuse of powers and corruption by enhancing transparency and accountability. It also has um, some positive effects in unifying countries or settling conflicts by accommodating the min minorities, often ethnic and marginalized groups through an inclusive system of government. Thank you.